Hello and welcome. This is lecture 20. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to get to it. Uh, so, uh, as you see from the title, it's a perhaps ominous title or a confusing title, Chisel Grab Bank. What do I mean? Uh, well, this lecture I've been putting together over the course of offering this, and it's a chance to kind of clarify um, various details about Chisel. Uh, this happens after an entire quarter. So looking over the assignments during the quarter, I see these various things. I incorporate that feedback into this lecture. Also, a lot of this content from this lecture, I also revise back into the slides during the quarter, so that way, hopefully folks are, you know, clear this conceptions from the beginning. Uh, so it's kind of always, you know, uh, some stuff. And then at the end of today's lecture, there's more, you know, chisel what else questions. I can try and answer those on the fly, and we'll see how we go. Okay, so, yeah, I actually do have code today. <laughs> but let's remind ourselves first of what we're doing. Uh, and... I, I do want to, you know, acknowledge the great work the students this class are doing. I think you all are making a bigger leap than you realize in terms of writing uh, chisel and hardware generators. Uh, but as a reminder of all the crazy things that are going on, maybe now it feels intuitive to you, but what's actually going on? Well, uh, as I keep saying, your chisel design is a valid Scala program, right? As you've seen, right? The, your IDE will give you a red underline if it's not going to compile, or sometimes you even get Scala compilers. But first of all, your chisel design is a valid Scala program, right? Chisel is simply just a library inside of Scala. And thus, when we keep saying we're writing Chisel, even though it feels like a language to us, technically, it's an embedded domain-specific language in Scala. Um, and so when we instantiate Chisel components, um, that's going to be instantiate some object, right? Uh, and everything we reference, even if it's something we don't actually think we're creating, actually creates something, right? So for example, let's say you maybe one of your lines Maybe you're making uh, you know, something else and you're like, you know, adding four as a uint. That four dot u actually is creating a you know, chisel object for that literal four, right? And as you make these objects, they all have inputs and outputs, and there are statements as a result, you know, make these connections, right? And so a collection of all of these uh, components, all these objects is being tracked inside of a module. Remember, we extend a module to be inside of a chisel scope, and even though we can write Scala functions that don't extend module, Eventually, that function needs to find its way into a calling location that has module on your outside. You've all seen that error. Um, when you do chisel connections, right, these are causing side effects to these chisel objects, right? We're connecting up inputs and outputs and wiring things together. Um, and so, yeah, we are making changes. And so, you know, in summary, what have we done? Your chisel design is a Scala program that instantiates chisel things and then connects them, right? So I keep saying, you know, sometimes it's confusing what to write. Let's think about what components you need and how to connect them, right? That's kind of the, the key point. Um, and if there's an uncertainty about, you know, well, what components should I be creating, that's fine. That just means you got to do a little bit more early design work, perhaps on a whiteboard or on paper, thinking about, you know, what is this going to do? If you can't draw your, your hardware on a diagram, that's a sign that you need to put a little more thought into what's going to go into this hardware, right? Just starting to write code right away without that plan to make it hard, right? But if you have that plan, chills gives you the tools to write that efficiently. Yeah, you can describe what you're instantiating and how you can put it all together. And all the parameterization, flexibility, and all this talk about generators, that's actually really the Scala stuff more than the Chisel stuff, right? The Chisel stuff is simple. The Chisel is, you know, instantiate a mux, instantiate an adder, a wire, a register, whatever. And all the cool generation stuff, that's really just the Scala, right? Um, and yeah, like I said, our, our goal is to really just connect all these things up, in particular to the inputs and outputs of the modules. Uh, as you've all experienced, if you don't connect things to an input or output, the tools will prune that away. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the goal. So, Paul, maybe pause here for any questions or comments on this kind of this mind model of uh, how what is Chisel doing, what is Scala doing? Cool. Okay, well, let's advance. All right. Um, so, this is another thing that comes up sometimes, is people sometimes get confused about what is static versus dynamic, right? Uh, so first of all, what do we mean by those words? So static, of course, means unchanging. Dynamic does mean changing, right? So that normally would be pretty clear, right? You can imagine if you have a hardware component, the hardware connectivity is not going to change, right? The wires have certain, you know, start and end points. Uh, you have a certain number of logic gates, whatever. That's all static. What is going to change is the values on those wires, right? So, you know, the, the hardware, of course, is static. The structure, you know, is not changing. The values flowing on the uh, hardware is dynamic, it's changing. Now, the wrinkle, of course, is with Chisel, when you have a program, uh, 
that program makes it feel a little bit more dynamic, right? It, as a program executes, you're kind of wiring up that hardware. So as a result, there's a little bit of confusion about um, what's the academic about that. And remember, the goal of your chisel design is a Scala program. You're trying to describe that static structure for the hardware. The you know behavior of dynamic signals on the hardware, that's not what we're doing in chisel, right? That's what's going to happen um, emergently as the thing is either simulated or even exists in hardware, right? So um, even when we have places when we think we're doing something just kind of, you know, varying things, perhaps like a VEC or a MUX, remember that under the hood, you know, VEC is done with a MUX, and that even though we have that flexibility and perhaps a when statement, it's getting turned into a static structure by the tools, right? So at the end of the day, it's going to get turned into the right combination of MUXs such that, you know, these wires, you know, have a single driver, and it may fan out to multiple consumers, but the point is that it's all static structurally, right? And so even though the wires' values can change, uh, remember, of course, wires have no internal state, and they simply just take their input directly to their output. Um, in the, of course, in the real world, there's some small amount of delay, but from the point of view of chisel, we don't talk about that delay. Um, so if a wire changes value over time, because input changes over value over time, that's fine, right? That doesn't change the fact this is a static, you know, structural topology. Uh, meanwhile, like a register or a memory, that does have internal state. Uh, they only change at the rising clock edge. Uh, you know, we've talked about people want to do latches or other things that want to get a little bit more out there, but by default, you know, vanilla chisel, synchronous, positive clock, that kind of stuff. Um, and so when it comes to the clocking in chisel, right, because the clock is implicit, uh, we often lose track that things are clocked, right? But remember that basically everything in your design is not clocked unless it's a register, right? Um, modules pass around a clock signal just so it's available if you have a register. Everything else is, you know, combinational and effectively immediate in chisel. Of course, in real hardware, some, you know, natural propagation delay. Um, so cool. This is kind of just reminding ourselves of this, of this situation. Great. I'm going to pop this up here. It's a dense slide. I'm going to put up for any questions while people are thinking about it. Okay. Cool. All right. So here's an easy one. All right. This is an example of something that comes up in chisel. Uh, this is a contrived example, but I guess the idea across concisely. Uh, what happens if you put whens inside of whens? Uh, perfectly fine. Now, in this case, where we're assigning an output inside of a when statement, it's important that that output uh, is assigned under all conditions, right? So if it's assigned in a when, it needs to have another value in the else when, or perhaps a default value. So in this case, we have a default value, um, you know, and see, these nested whens are going to result in basically being the and, right? Because it's only going to get down to here if, you know, in zero, in one, in two are all true, right? Now, if you have a structure like this, uh, for simplicity, you may find it easier to simply do an and, right? So you can say in zero and, you know, in one. Uh, so this is going to be... Functionally uh, the same, although actually even the Verilog itself is also easier to express, right? <laughs> um, and so you may say, okay, well, why would I not always do this? Well, a few reasons. Number one, uh, perhaps it's not going to be quite this contrived, right? Perhaps there's a situation where in some cases you want this, and there may be something deeply nested in the middle, but perhaps there's something along the way that you know, or something else. There's some other signal, you know, that has some other, you know, situation or something, right? In which case, this happens. But if you have this case where it's like a pure nesting of whens and no other lines intervening or no else whens, then sure, please, please combine them all together. And yeah, perhaps you might find this is more readable in your opinion. Who knows? Questions, comments? This is an example of something like that. I have a bunch of these coding examples where it's like, you know, things where when you're writing, it happens and, you know, you can imagine this comes up and it's just like, oh, wait, yeah, this might be another way of doing it. Yes. It's going to get, yeah, when's going to get turned into a mux? Yes. So the question is, wait, so I mean, I, I, I have a lecture, I told you all that when's turned into muxes. How come in the original code, you know, doesn't look, doesn't look like a mux, does it, right? Look at the original code. Uh, oops, that's gibberish. Uh, where's the mux, right? Uh, so... Remember that the whole point is to provide the right behavior, right? So 
Uh, when a when is nested, yes, this is associated with a true case. In this case, um, there is no false path. So because there is no false path, there's no need to have an else when. Because a false path means else when, right? There's an, there's an, well, not even just else when, it's an otherwise, sorry. There's an otherwise, you would have the, the false path, right? So because there's no otherwise, this is only the true path. And so that's the fertile tools under the hood are smart through the logic simplification to do it like this. Um, and so because of the way it was done, it created this, you know, uh, intermediate value. That's leading underscore is kind of a giveaway. This is something that you didn't declare. It's something that the tools generated for you. And yeah, it was the same thing, right? It's still effectively, uh, you know, this replace in there means you're gonna have a three input and, um, but yeah, this is an example of it would be better. So yeah, so when it comes to nesting whens, uh, yeah, that's gonna have cascaded muxes in theory, but it'll optimize that, you know, if it knows the false path is not being used, it can turn into an and or something. Also, of course, there's last connect semantics, right? Where if I was, for example, to do this, right, where we give kind of a default value and then based on our execution of the program, we kind of insert the whens afterwards. If we do it this way, of course, it's always gonna be zero independent of the muxes, right? Um, cool. Yes. Sometimes. Correct. Yeah. So the question was about vex. Yeah. So vex uh, only will use a mux if you dynamically select a component out of them. If you index them statically, the tools will recognize that and not need to put a mux in. So by, by indexing them statically, like, you know, you can imagine a scenario, hypothetically, of uh, let's say, uh, you know, you have like a four, uh, you know, I, let's say zero to uh, N, and then, you know, you have your vec of some sort, right? And you're doing V of I, right? So this indexing value is a Scala int rather than like a chisel U int. Right, and so as a result, uh, that indexing is done at program evaluation time, not in the hardware. This goes back to the prior slide about what's static versus dynamic, right? And so, like I said, static dynamic normally is really clear from like Verilog. Oh so, yeah, everything you're writing is structurally static. In the simulation, you dynamically apply the signals to it. In Chisel, is a little bit of a wrinkle to it where we have this, you know, program execution order has an impact, right? So we saw here last next semantics with the whens. Program execution order matters. In the case of a VEC, how you index the VEC matters. If you index up a Scala int, that's gonna be done while the program's running during elaboration time. If you index up a uint, you can see that's usually come in the form of a wire or a reg or something. That's gonna be, you know, structure connected in the hardware and it's gonna turn into a VEC, sorry, a MUX to access the VEC in the hardware. Cool, great questions. Okay. Let's keep going. So, yeah, uh, more on last next semantics, right? Um, so I keep saying, right, the, the oldest one wins and it doesn't always have to be a mux, right? So here's an example where we're gonna have just like the last slide where yeah, it's gonna override it if I zoom out a, side, a, a bit. Uh, and because the overriding is conditional, uh, yeah, you can see it uses a mux. Um, the prior slide, part of why I was able to get away not using a mux is not just that there was no false path, it's also that the result was a Boolean value, right? So that way it didn't need to actually like choose between two things. Cool. But yeah, as we've seen, right? Harder is going to click the one thing at a time. If we need to collect more than one thing, it has to go through mux and we, you know, use a mux to select which thing we're actually connected to dynamically. So the hardware always has a defined static structure, even though we have whens, et cetera. Cool. Okay. This is another thing that comes up. Less so in this class. I would say this class has done the best job yet at not using var. So kudos. Um, so, uh, you know, as I've expressed, var exists in Scala. You can use it. I recommend using it very rarely. Um, and the thing is, Chisel, for the most part, can't tell if using Valor var, right? So it's utter me nagging. Uh, you can get away with var, right? Until it turns out making your life hard debugging and you don't realize it's hard debugging because of the var. Um, and so like, so one of the things that comes up sometimes, some students have told me in prior conversations, oh, well, 
I use a var because I, I wanted the value to change as when hardware design's running, right? It's like, don't get to use the mutability of this reference to the fact that the hardware wire can change different values, right? Remember, static structurally, signals change dynamically. So you have a vowel pointing to a wire. Yes, that vowel is always going to point to that wire. However, that wire, once it's actual natural hardware or in simulation, can change its value, right? And the fact that the vowel doesn't even have any impact on that. Um, so let's say you tried to write a counter uh, in a creative way by saying, oh, I have a count and I want the count to be one plus that. So what are you going to get? Well, as you see in the uh, parentheses here, uh, that's always going to be, you know, zero plus one or just one in the hardware, right? So, oh, it's the bar, but no, no, no. Um, the key point is, uh, number one, for a counter, you need state, right? And a val or var is simply uh, a reference. In this case, this is a reference to a literal. In this case, you're adding to a reference, which itself is also literal. So you're going to have this hardware, which is 0 plus 1. Um, as we know, we can build a counter with a register. And in this case, so what are we doing? We're instantiating a register and then connecting the register plus 1 to the input register. Right? So this is the output register added to 1 connected back to the input of the register. Um, of course, we know we can build spiffier red, uh, counters, but it's kind of it's driving home these points, right? In this case, we're using a vowel. And yeah, the counter can, of course, change over time. It's perfectly fine in a vowel. It just means that counter, this reference, is always going to point to this register. And even though here we are changing on this line what its outputs and inputs are, uh, well, actually, in this case, we're changing its input. The output's not being changed. We're referring to it. That fact that you know it's a vowel is good. So. There's a lot of ways using var can come back to get you later on, and the whole class of bugs that is completely impossible if you use val. So please, 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 especially with chisel components, use val whenever possible, which is almost always. But you've, you've been doing a job, so this class has done the best job yet of mostly val. Okay, so uh, like I said, bad things can happen. Let's see a bad thing that can happen, right? So. Uh, here we have uh, an example, which, you know, is going to basically do that floor operation. Um, but uh, let's say uh, you chose to use var rather than val here. Right now, it's going to do the right thing, right? Hey, with less than zero, uh, you know, um, set to zero. Otherwise, this passes through just fine. Okay. But now, as you see from the comment, if I... Do that, whoopsies, you know, equals to the colon equals, smallest of mistakes, completely wrong, completely wrong. Now, if you had used a val, let's see what would happen. So if a val, this is okay. Remember, we aren't changing w. We're just changing what the input w is connected to. But from Scala's point of view, w's reference is unchanged. It's just the object of points to some, you know, internal side effect. If you try the same typo, kablamo, right? You're reassigning to a val. Yeah. Oh, great. So how does uh, the connection operator, colon equals, change inside there? So let's be really clear about this, right? When I say w colon equals 0.s, um, we are, there's w, which is a reference in Scala, and it points to some chisel thing. So that reference W is completely unchanged. It points to the same chisel thing in the same location of memory it always did. So that reference, unchanged. The thing it points to is being mutated. That has side effects, right? I think internally, you know, that chisel thing has a field for where does my input come from? And now the input field, which originally was empty, is now occupied, right? For example, as we know, um, if, for example, uh, we neglected to have this line, it's going to yell at us to, because, yeah, it knows, hey, wait, that io.out component, no one ever picked it to an input. It has no input. Exactly, yeah. So to repeat the comment, yeah. So you can think of this statement as, you can think of like w as a pointer. You never actually see the real pointer value. You're just dereferencing it. So here you are dereferencing it and mutating what it points to, but we're not changing. Sorry, change, routine the thing it points to, but we aren't changing the pointer address, so to speak, right? Um, 
And yeah, if you actually go digging around inside Scala, you actually can see that, yeah, we were really calling this operator on this component with this argument. And so this is the thing about Scala where it's kind of interesting where um, because of the syntax, this looks very natural, like we have like a, like a natural language here. But really, I believe this super obtuse phrasing might also work. Yeah, right? Oof. Who wants that, right? But you could, right? You could. And because Scala allows you to do things like um, call functions without the parens, actually it's probably better if I also remove the dot too. And then also instead of doing a dot, if you immediately follow the function name, it calls that function. This does work. I mean, anything. It's just the language syntax, the language grammar. I'm not, you know, enough of a PL person to give you the exact right terms. Does not require to use the dot, right? You can use the dot. You can not use the dot. And the reason why I chose to align needing the dot is because you can have a more natural embedded syntax for a new language, which I love this stuff. Um, the push recently has been to remove that kind of stuff because it's confusing the people that are not familiar with Scala. So it's been kind of pushed to have more dots and look more like Java, which I don't like. <laughs> this is people are kind of on board. Because, yeah, like I said, we often see me, you see me writing code all the time of, you know, oh, yeah, I have some sort of list. I say map and then, you know, whatever our function is, right? But, no, there's been a push to have, you know, do it more formally, right, like this. And, yeah, it's more obvious people to know Scala by, like, the spaces. And, but, yeah, it's a little bit of charm is being lost. But it's the same thing either way. It's a syntactic sugar. Um, and, yeah, you can see in this case, right, using val, there's a class of errors you don't have to worry about, right? Because you'd be... If you had this var here and you had this situation, you'd be, you know, post, right? And you wouldn't know until you did debugging, like in a very log or something. Um, and the good news is you don't often need var. Like I said, now that you understand more, both the way you've done all quarter as well as me reminding you in this lecture, that you don't need var to have a single change. You only need var if you want to have the Scala program change what it points to. You don't need it very often, right? The one case I said you might want var sometimes, maybe you're doing like a, a for loop or a while loop. But now that you know, map, reduce, for each, even just plain old four, uh, sometimes you don't really need that var, right? You can get away without it. And then again, like a single var, if a single loop, it's not the end of the world. That's not, a, that's not a cardinal sin. Just be aware that, you know, you're exposing yourself to more errors, right? The whole point is use the language to prevent the errors, and then you save yourself time. Great, great questions, though. Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, so on the same spirit of uh, mutability, uh, some folks get super hooked on mutability. And I'm trying to remind folks that, you know, you can use a seek, right? So yeah, you can do an array buffer. Uh, you can um, uh, fill it up, do whatever you want to do. We've done that. Um, but also, even for seek, right, you can create it. So basically, the only challenge using a immutable collection like a seek is that um, you can't, you know, fill it up one by one. So even though this immutable structure, even though we're only going to write these values once, it's kind of easiest for us to, you know, incrementally do things like this. With a seek, you kind of need to fill it all at once. Now, technically, you could write a recursive function to generate a seek where you kind of keep returning one all the time and depending on in recursion. Perfectly fine. Uh, but in Chisel, we often don't need that kind of stuff. Often we get by, you know, what kind of things you put in a seek? Well, maybe you need to instantiate end modules. Well, yeah, then it's seek.fill. Or maybe you want something with numbers. In this case, fine, seek.tabulate. Between seek.fill, seek.tabulate, that carries a large fraction of the things you need. If for some reason you really want to have like a certain ordering, you can roll up the sleeves and do fold left or recursion. Or fine, you know what? In that case, fine, use the for loop. Um, but immutable collections, like an array buffer, so that, that means it can be mutated in Scala. For the same reason why I was saying var can be dangerous. Having mutable collection also is possible if you accidentally overwriting things or something, and that's a problem. Yes. Oh, good question. So in this example, here I have an array buffer and I mutate it. Versus in the uh, this version, I seem to create a ridge and incremented. Does this mean a sequence has twice as much memory? Yes. Yeah, it does. So it is definitely, um, uh, in this case, um, going to use more memory. However, remember in Chisel, we usually don't run out of memory too often. Uh, but it's possible, I guess. Additionally, it's also garbage collected, right? So the language could recognize, oh, wait, you know, 
you're using incremented, you're not using a ridge later on, we can just forget a ridge. So I wouldn't, I would prioritize readability and correctness in your code over runtime and usage of the, of the chisel elaboration. A good question. Yeah, I see a question in the back. Oh. oh, so the question was, for this example here, I showed, you know, originally W is assigned to a wire, and then if I use a var and I reassign it, now W points to this. Yeah, so it depends on the garbage collection routine. Um, I would... Must confess, I don't know the exact details of what goes on inside of the most modern JVM's garbage collection, but uh, it does have the ability to collect cycles. So perhaps it's not just a reference counting, it's also, you know, a copying kind of garbage collector. So yeah, in this case, that would be a dangling bit of memory. I assume we would eventually reclaim that. However, like I said, the odds that that particular thing comes up may be kind of low because, you know, the lifespan of the thing is so short and your program's probably going to be done before it runs out of memory. Correct, yeah, so, correct, it doesn't matter if it's garbage collected, and even if it's floating around in memory, as you said, Chisel may be still be tracking that node, and it may not be until it gets to the fertile stage where it's processing the, the graph, it recognizes, oh wait, this is not reachable from an output, so I don't need it. Well, yeah. Uh, could the compiler optimize back to back immutable collections into mutating the original collection? Uh, perhaps. Um, yeah, so one of the things about functional programming, we have, you know, very controlled notions about um, what is mutable and also when things are reachable based on references. In theory, that enables a lot stronger compilerizations. For the particular scenario you've described, I don't know if that's possible, but it could be. Uh, at least in theory, I don't know if it's actually done in practice, but it definitely seems possible. I mean, so every, if you read the release notes for every version of Scala, they always say the Scala compiler is getting better optimizing. Um, and so these are kind of things it could be doing. I don't know in particular which optimizations it does or does not do. But the claim is that a lot of times code does slowly go faster over time because they are getting better optimizing Scala. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So sometimes you, you can imagine doing lazy evaluation. There is a lazy keyword in Scala. And so I don't know how much lazy it does on its own. It's one of these things where, in any situation, hardware design, software design, if you can optimize things in the way that the user can't tell a the difference, then that's usually a legal optimization. It's kind of the rules of the game, right? So, and our processors, you know, as long we can do instructions out of order, as long as we give them in order exceptions, they can't tell, right? Uh, when it comes to the hardware semantics, right, if we give the exact same functional semantics, we need some sort of optimization under hood, yeah, that should be a fair game. Uh, and sometimes there's some subtle, subtle, subtle nuances between two different ways of doing it. That's why you can't do it. That's like why it's not the same semantics. But uh, yeah, I suspect some of the things we describe in the functional programming, it should be possible to know knowing things are immutable and what's referenced either to free things early or to perhaps mutate them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the two immutable collections, barring some optimizations from the compiler, may temporarily take up more space, but I really want to emphasize how this is not going to be a problem, right? Typically in our chisel designs, right, you know, you seeks to hold components, right? So you're holding 
uh, modules or some other component, right? And so as a result, that's not going to be, you know, 10 billion, right? And yeah, our modern computers have gigabytes, tens of gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes of memory. And so um, even though Scala can be a bit inefficient with memory usage at times, uh, I would be surprised there'd be a need to change the design to reduce memory usage. That would surprise me. So if I, um, like, like, let's say, for example, these were, you did a seek of uints, and then you made another seek that was applying math to those uints, right? Uh, the resulting chisel object graph would be the seek is in memory. It's not really a thing in the hardware, but the hardware is now a collection of adders adding the original collection contents to new collection contents. And so the fact that it was two collections in Scala doesn't matter. What matters is you've defined hardware that has, you know, two nodes and an adder per element, so to speak. So the fact is that two collections versus one collection is not going to change that. What matters is the hardware you're describing. So every time you reference a uint or something or reference a literal, an operator, a mod component, that's going to create hardware. However you happen to refer to that from Scala, whether it be immutable, immutable thing like a val or var or immutable, immutable collection, doesn't change the chisel itself. Cool. Good questions, Aldo. Okay. Um, so one thing that comes up, and it's one of these things that's not easy to do the first time you write a module, but perhaps as you get more familiar and more experienced, you can try this. Um, Try to do some special cases, right? Find ways to like write your module in a way such that rather than a lot of ifs and if elses, you can just kind of handle all the cases at once, right? So perhaps you can do things like, you know what, say certain parameters are you know not allowed and make a constraint, put in documentation, have an assert, that's all good. Um, but other times maybe you have to have that one if statement, but you can, sometimes you can step around it. You can be clever how you define things. We saw like fold left, you know, it's very graceful with zero elements. That's nice. Um, and so, yeah, so like I said, if you can try to keep your code more general, what's actually interesting, if you read the Osterhout software engineering book I keep promoting in this course, um, one of the points he makes in that book is that surprisingly, sometimes more general purpose code is actually simpler. You might think by being specialized, it'll be simpler than more general purpose code, but sometimes by being more general, it actually does get simpler. And so, Try it out, write it one way, write it another way, see if you can't kind of, you know, remove special cases when you can. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you have to have the if statement or an if else, it happens. But see what you can do sometimes, yeah. Cool. Um, so sometimes people ask, okay, well what about four versus four each? Which should you use? Um, they're both gonna do iteration. They're both gonna have um, that kind of stuff. Now, remember when I gave a functional program lecture, I said, use for each when you definitely do not want the output, you only want the um, effect, the side effect, right? If you actually want the output, then of course use map. What's to say, you, you know, you, you don't want the output, so you're not using map, but you could choice between four for each. This is the personal style thing. Um, I think four is great. Uh, if you need to create the range, you know, like zero to n, and you know, four i zero to n, or even for, you know, I think uh, four is fantastic. Um, if the collection already exists, you know, maybe like a, like a seek of a bunch of modules or something, uh, then for each is great, right? You know, modules for each, and then go into it. This is my own personal style. Uh, technically, you know, sometimes when you have a need to numerically index, you could you know take your original collection, then do zip with index, and then do for each. That to me seems kind of cumbersome, right? It's like more. More, more characters, more text, more concepts. Just use a four. Cool. Questions, comments on that? Cool, okay, then um, this is another small one. So I keep saying tools optimize stuff and guess what? Tools optimize stuff, but there's still some places where uh, believe it or not the tools accidentally or just can't optimize. Or you know what, a little bit of work on your end could make it either very else involved. Um, so I, I would make a modest effort to optimize your logic. I wouldn't, you know, draw a K-map or anything, but uh, don't do anything that's egregious. Uh, also, you find yourself doing like a lot of copy and pasting for anything. That's usually, a, you know, a red flag. You should at least, you know, refactor to be less redundant. Um, 
So, for example, I saw less this quarter than prior quarters, you know, on the game of life. Uh, some folks, you know, often do, you know, mod and divide, which um, is one way to, you know, get the row and column indices. However, if we know things are going to be um, uh, done in a certain way, perhaps it's expensive, right? So maybe, for example, like especially the matrices, uh, you can avoid the need for mod and divide, which are very expensive hardware operators, uh, by using counters, right? And by making sure your counter is reset at the right times, so you can avoid the need for those. And so an adder is really cheap, especially compared to a divider or a, a, a mod. Um, it's also reminding people that, you know, divide and mod, if you do it as a multi-cycle implementation, is moderately expensive. If you do divide or mod combinationally instantly, that's extremely expensive in hardware, right? So, so like one of the biggest most things you can ask for. So yeah, so please, if you are going to do divide or mod, you must do divide or mod, please do multi-cycle, do not implementation for it. But if you are going to use it, Yes, the operators exist, but you're asking a lot of the hardware. Um, sometimes folks recreate, you know, indices by using multiply. Same thing. Multipliers are a lot more expensive than adders. Perhaps if you use counters the right way or concatenations the right way, you can avoid that. Obviously, don't make it super complicated and get it wrong, but these operations do add up sometimes. Um, likewise, for accessing bits in chisel, if you want a certain bit. In C, we're all used to, you know, shifting and anding and that kind of stuff. No need to do that in Chisel, right? In Chisel, you can access bits directly with, you know, bit extraction. There's also even tail and head, depending on what you're doing. You can use cat to put them back together. So shifting should only be if you really need to shift. If you're just trying to extract or combine bits, you can, you know, combine with cat or extract with bit extraction. Cool. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Someone is sharing that even though Verilog had a division operator, it was not considered synthesizable for a long time. That sounds right to me. Like I said, it's really, to do a division combinationally is like, what is that? You're like, what are you asking me to do, right? It's like a really big ask. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I can even share a small aside on that. For example, like I said, for research, my research group makes a RTL simulator. We uh, support arithmetic operations efficiently on current CPUs, right? So you turn your hardware design into the plus code to run efficiently on current CPUs. We handle arbitrary with signals for everything. However, uh, if you ask us to give division or mod for more than 64 bits, it triggers an assertion because I don't want to think about how to do a multi-word division, multi-word modulus. If possible, it can be done. I still want to think about it. Guess what? In the almost eight years this project existed, we actually do have a couple of users. Nobody's complained. Because nobody's chipping hardware that does 64, more than 64 bits of division at once combinationally, right? If they're going to do a big division, they're going to write their own divider or something, right? Because that's otherwise too expensive. So that little, you know, simplification I made in the simulator, perfect crime because no one's ever thought to ask for a 64-bit combination multiplier. Or sorry, I should say more than 64-bit combination multiply. Because, yeah, it's going to be expensive. Um, here's an interesting style point. Uh, what about declaring things inside when? So they're actually like a, like a module or a significant amount of um, chisel. Now, there's two things going on this time. I'm kind of make clear about it. Uh, this example is showing where when might confuse somebody semantically what's happening. Uh, they may not understand what's happening. But also just as a general style thing, sometimes I find it more clear to, if you have big modules in your, if you essentially big things in your module, maybe put them up towards the top of the file so that way it's kind of clear to there rather than burying it deep inside of a when. So in this case, we have a counter defined inside of a when. So maybe we'll ask the class, uh, when does this counter count? I've heard, I've heard never, I've heard always. Any other options? That is correct, yeah. So the right answer was it does count always, right? So if you look at the Verilog, uh, you see we have the wrap value because it's counting, and yeah, it's always assigning wrap value. The application of the enable, that affects the output, gen four, which is connected to the output. Um, it does not affect the counter value, right? So the fact that this count is inside of a when block doesn't actually anyhow impact the counter. Right, so I could put it up here, and I'd recommend putting it up here because it's kind of more clear what's going on. 
and yeah, this is going to have exactly the same var log, exactly the same behavior. Um, like I said, you might imagine someone writing this code thinking, oh, I put the counter inside the one block, I can turn it on or off that way. Um, I'm gonna get to one point and get to your question. If you did want to turn it on or off, as suggested, we you know counter is overloaded, you could pass it and enable there, and now you get the behavior you want, where depending on the enable, it's gonna impact um, whether or not the counter is counting. At least it should, let me double check that. Uh, actually, does it have that impact? Oh, here's a very small if, right, yeah. Tiny of this. Okay, did you have a question? But yeah, so the point is that, you know, like I said, hardware, chisel, static structure. If you reference anything in any when, any mux, any else when, any otherwise, if you reference it, you've essentially the hardware. It exists. It's because that's the path that's not active right now. It doesn't mean the hardware goes away. The hardware is always there. And so if you essentially a giant module, right? It's not like when the when's not true, the module goes away. The module's always there. And in this case, the counter is not only always there, as described, the channel center library defines this counter will have enable connected to one if you don't give it an enable. Um, and so yes, I recommend for that reason, putting big things outside of one blocks. There's a reason why you can't put them inside one blocks. It's just, to me, conceptually, I find it more clear that they always exist and it's just through changing connections based on something else. Question. Yeah, so okay, so what does it mean? Well, like he's saying that you know, hardware always exists, but like you put in a cert inside of a hardware, it seems to impact this functionality. Yes, it does. I'm gonna get to a certs later. Um, cool. But for modules and other things like that, it doesn't impact its existence. But for asserts, it's a little bit different. Cool. Other questions? Great. Okay, we can put this back. Um, oops. Great. Keep going. Um, this is a small one. You know, uh, as you're aware, uh, 0, 2, n minus 1, or 0 until n are, you know, the same thing. Um, so you have exclusive and inclusive. The reason why they bother you that in Scala is that way you can avoid the need to do minus ones or something or plus ones. And so occasionally when you're debugging quickly, you're, oh yeah, I need to go one less or one more. And so you do a plus one or minus one, consider changing this keyword. A small little one. Like I said, this language has a lot of features. It's a rich language, but when you kind of start drinking enough of the Kool-Aid, it, it comes together. Um, back to asserts. Okay, so uh, believe it or not, you may not have come across this. There, you may see these require sometimes. There is a cert, and perhaps you didn't know, there's actually two asserts. There's a chisel assert and a scala assert. <laughs> and so, wait, there's three constructs that seem to be very similar, right? You have some sort of property you're checking, and the question is, who's checking it when, under which, which conditions, right? So let's kind of go through the various cases, right? So a chisel assert is something that's gonna be checked in simulation. Right, that's the key phrase, in simulation. Not in hardware, because it's not synthesizable. So it's in simulation is only when the chisel uh, assert happens. Now, if you have a chisel assert and you look at the Verilog, it will actually put the Verilog equivalent of an assert in the Verilog, but that's not a synthesizable Verilog. So once again, only impactful in simulation. Uh, so how does you know, the tools know which one, when to use this one? Well, guess what? If the thing inside the assert block contains chisel objects based on the type, it can tell, oh yeah, you want the chisel assert. Uh, and you can even, of course, not just have an assert, you can even put in, uh, in, a, in a message in there so people know, oh yeah, you failed to assert an assertion, here's what it tells you what it is, you know, A not equal B under this case, right? Um, so yeah, chisel assert are the things you're putting in your design, they're a great idea, but these are gonna be evaluated, you know, as the design's running in simulation. So there should be things where it's in the properties of the data on the wires, what you use these for. Um, now, that's not the only thing you have available to you, you also have, an assert from Scala, which is run as a Scala program doing elaboration. This is, happens during construction, not simulation. And this is the one that's gonna be invoked if you um, pass the assert keyword, you know, that function, a Scala object. This is a Scala object is not a chisel object. You're gonna get this assert. Um, 
And yeah, it's going to, you know, run during perm execution, which is, you know, construction, elaboration, whatever you want to call it. This is what you do to kind of check properties of your input, right? And make sure, you know, you didn't have some sort of construction. This is about the structure of your program. Now, you may be saying, wait a second, uh, that sounds good. Two asserts, depending on type, does the right thing. You may have seen it on some slides using require. Uh, what the heck is that? Uh, once again, Scala, rich language. Scala has require and assert. Uh, there's a lot of cases where you could use require or assert, and for your use case, you will not appreciate the difference. So I'm going to be blunt about that and be honest about that. Um, the both both are possible. They do have a difference. They both are evaluated by Scala as your program is running. Um, and like I said, if you always use Scala assert and chisel assert and never use require, you'd be just fine. Um, why do they have two different things? Well, this is a Scala thing. Uh, so you can, with flags, tell a compilation execution to uh, disable asserts. If you want the code to run fast, non-debug mode, you can say, hey, drop the asserts. Uh, it'll not drop the requires. The requires um, are always going to be programmed, they're always going to be enforced as it's running. But if you, for some reason, wanted to remove the assert, perhaps you have tons of asserts and make the program down, you can remove them with the flags. Now, because this scenario doesn't come up when we write chisel too much, like I said this difference is small. This is just for your own uh, knowledge. Now, why would Scala designers decide to have both of these? Well, uh, they kind of think of it as requires for like checking parameters and input consistency, making sure like, if this is not true, this thing is not gonna work, right? You wanna be clear about this. You obviously put require on top of modules, you know, making sure parameters can conform to certain bounds. Meanwhile, assert is for checking for internal consistency or you know, perhaps checking some proper data structure as opposed to checking the inputs themselves, right? So stylistically, I find it convenient to just try to use require because usually when you use these things in your chisel designs, you're trying to state properties about the parameters you're being given, which, you know, matches the notion of inputs and scholars. That's why requires a good match for that. And then when you use assert, it's usually for the chisel itself and the actual hardware. So the Scala assert, I don't intend to try to use it too often, but like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the Scala assert and require are mostly interchangeable. And to be honest, I couldn't even tell you the flag that lets you disable asserts, but it is possible. Question, yes. Assume, uh, I don't know. Oh, really? Oh, so sorry, assume, yes. Lab six, that is from Kevin. So that, 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 that's the formal verification of Chisel. Yeah. Yes, so, good, okay. Okay, good question. Yeah, so lab six, uh, use the formal verification techniques from Chisel test. Um, they, you know, Kevin, of course, uh, is the creator of this content. Yeah, so they use assume as a keyword introduced by that functionality to state properties about the things, and that assume works its way into the formal verification flow. And yes, they did choose to overload the assert keyword for some of the formal verification properties. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I'm going to talk my way through this slowly because I'm only partially sure about this. So assert on this slide, the way I'm describing as a chisel assert, is this property of your hardware dynamically evaluated while it's running. The assert from formal verification, whole point formal verification is a static and you know comprehensive. So in that case, it is more of a static, not simulation based thing. And so depending on which flavor of assert you're getting, you get one or the other. And now I'm sitting here pausing, wondering how do I know which one I'm getting? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, well, formal verification, normally you opt into by you know extending certain things and bringing it in. But once you've brought it in, what happens to that dynamic um, assert? That's a great question. I should look into that. You might call it like a static assert versus dynamic assert. Static is the formal and the dynamic is like, you know, evaluated during simulation. Yeah, which one do you get in that case? That's a good question. I might have to play around with that a little bit. Yeah, so that's a good point. I should revise the slide to explain assume and formal. Um, cool. Okay, so here's, you know, us playing around with different types of assert, right? So here we're going to require, you know, our width is greater than zero. Um, and you see we have this assert, which is going to be dynamic assert flavor, right? So here's that non-synthesizable uh, Verilog, right? In particular, what it's doing, you see, is it's um, 
uh, doing two things, right? So it's using some if defs to, you know, only be running when it's not being synthesized. But then, of course, uh, it prints the failing message as well as killing the simulation, right? So if I didn't have that assert there, this goes away. This, of course, is checking the input sanity. So if I said minus one, it's going to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Requirement failed. Um, and but this could also just as well be an assert, and it'll have you know similar but different uh, behavior. Um, yeah, uh, you can just uh, the question was how do you get an error message assert? Yeah, you can say uh, you know width uh, must be greater than zero. That should just work. So then if I give it uh, you know zero. Yeah. Question, yeah. So you're saying right here? Oh, I see what you're saying. You, well, you want to cast this. Yeah. Oops. Well, so require is not going to do, but if I change this to assert. Um, I assume this is going to be evaluated at runtime to be true. And perhaps if we're lucky, Fertile's not going to... Well, it didn't print anything out, right? Because like I said, this evaluates the true and it's always true. So this is this is not going to trigger the formal stuff because I don't have the formal pulled in, but yeah, as a chisel assertion because it's always true. Yeah, I'll try to do that. But yeah, in terms of the formal, yeah, that's a good question. Cool. Um, another question I get sometimes in office hours, and it's always worth talking over is okay, what should go in a module versus a function versus a class or how many modules? Um, Number one bit of advice, do what makes it most clear to you as a human and easiest to reuse. Those are your top priorities, right? Everything else is secondary. So make sure it's clear and easy to reuse. That's what you want, right? Um, you want to be correct. You want to be clear. If you always just use modules for things, even though I asked you some of the earlier labs to like try and use a function or something, uh, that's fine, right? If you always use modules, that's going to be just fine. Using a class that's not a, also a module, this you know class without saying module, that's possible. We know how to do that. That's not as commonly needed. Uh, I feel like either use a module or a function. The the class in between is not quite as helpful. Now, what might you consider when doing this? Number one, beyond everything I said, you know, easy for humans to get right, right? But also reuse, uh, ease of testing, right? That if you can have your abstraction boundaries such as the component you want to test easy to describe and easy to test, that's perfect. If you're really complicated behavior and you find it really hard to write a test bench, that's probably a sign maybe you've composed it the wrong way. Maybe it's better to have, you know, tests for the parts of that module and then have an integration testing like that, right? Going back to the Osterhout book, they, there he describes the notion of pulling complexity downwards. It's easy to say, oh yeah, make your design simple. You know, don't have any complexity. Uh, sometimes you have to have some complexity. It's going gonna, it's gonna to exist, right? But if you can shove it around your design such that you only need to embrace the complexity when you really need to embrace the complexity, otherwise it's hidden behind some abstraction, that's ideal, right? So, you know, maybe you have some really complicated timing inside your module, but from the outside world, it's just a decoupled I.O. And they see the coupled I.O. and they only need to think about the coupled I.O. And you can think about all the crazies inside that module. If you aren't changing the internals of that module, you don't think all the crazy timing, right? Just put it behind the couple or something, right? Um, so there are any times when, like I said, you can default into always using modules is just fine, but why would you reconsider not using a module? Uh, sometimes writing up a module for something is uh, a lot of work. Uh, you know, you have to write like an IO and a whole bunch of stuff. And you saw in some of the labs, like, like, like the Game of Life lab, or maybe Matmo or something, sometimes it's easy just to kind of describe an operation of a function, right? Taking a couple arguments, they're actually chisel things, return a chisel thing, the function is easier, right? Also, as a function, easier to toss into your functional programming, right? You know, if you're using like a map or a 4-H or something like that, that's a lot more fluid and nice. Um, 
There's one third case, which you're probably not going to come across in your labs, but it comes up in research sometimes. If you have a bunch of modules and you make a really, really big design, you know, uh, as a result, you know, you have a few big modules internally have a lot of internal modules, so a lot of modules inside those. You may actually have like tens, hundreds of thousands of modules in your design. This can happen, right? Um, for the most part, tools are fine with that. However, you know, if you really start pushing it, uh, you can use up hundreds of gigabytes of, you know, RAM, <laughs> which your JVM, things take a while, fan spin ups, all that kind of business. It turns out that sometimes if you have fewer modules, some of these things get a little better. Depending on your actual physical limitation flow, the hardware will be completely unchanged, or maybe it will matter, depending on if you're doing hierarchical or non-hierarchical synthesis, if you're a flattening design or not. But sometimes having fewer modules can help some of these things, right? You have a shorter tool runtime for these massive designs. It's very very hierarchy is simple. When you're navigating it, the waveforms are simpler. And so one way to do this, sometimes the lowest level entities, maybe make those not models, maybe make those functions. So maybe instead of having, you know, 20,000 modules, you have 3,000 modules, the lowest level things now are all functions rather than modules. But like I said, for the most part, get it right, make it clear, easy to reuse. Those are all the most important things. Um, testing is another good thing to think about. Hiding complexity inside the abstraction, whether it be a function or uh, a module. And then, like I said, the reasons why you offer a function, as you get more familiar, you'll find cases where it's easier and kind of become more intuitive to you. Uh, I said this is last special small detail about performance, but it's performance of the tools rather than the hardware. Cool. Questions? Yes. When should you use a main function? That's another good question, right? So uh, we've kind of blurred a lot of those things in this class where, because we use notebooks all the time, notebooks don't have mains, right? So that's kind of like, you know, we're getting away with that. So the reason why we're able to get away without mains inside of a notebook is not because it's Jupyter, but because actually it's this language, uh, Almond, which is making Scala more scripting-like. Uh, so that's the one that's required of a main. As you've seen in your homeworks in um, project, when you write proper Scala, not this Almond, and you you know use SPT and that kind of stuff, uh, you need to have some sort of main, right? Now, there's some caveats to that, right? As we've all seen, uh, if you say SPT test, it seems to do the right thing, right? So guess what? Special case for test. Test goes digging around. Things extend test. It'll run them. You also, if you're using IntelliJ, can like right click on a function and just like run that sometimes. Special case. But in the common case, you're supposed to have uh, at least one main. If you have more than one main, it's going to ask you which main you want to run in the package scope. You got to tell like, I want you to run this main versus that main. Um, so main normally, like every other program you've come across in your life, is where the code flow starts and runs. Um, however, um, in Chisel, we often can get away without a main if we're doing only simulation and testing. Now, in a more proper, larger project, you probably will have a main function in at least one file. And that main's purpose is going to be to call the Verilog emitter. So that way you get the Verilog out and you may actually have some annotations you add to your design for how you want for a little process your design. That's what's going to happen inside that main. So if you look at like existing, you know, taped out Chisel designs, if you have at least one main, that main usually actually produces the Verilog. Cool, yeah. Oh, yeah, so how do I get Verilog in the real designs? Uh, not print, get Verilog. <laughs> uh, so that's something I do in Jupyter. Uh, they have ways to call into the Chisel library to launch a backend. that will do that for them. And so the get Verilog shortcut we have inside of Jupyter of this class, that's calling into the backend. Uh, the way you invoke the backend into Verilog may be different in the real design versus the way we've done it for this course. Also, the API occasionally they change with new versions of the chisel, so the way I'm doing it may be a old way, and perhaps there's a new, better way to call that. But yes, there's basically a backend you can call that will do that. And so your main function may be like four lines, you know, like basically, allow, you know, here, instantiate this module and then turn it to Verilog. Cool. Um, this is a small one. Uh, so, uh, Sometimes you want to kind of like uh, change the type of something, right? Uh, where you you know how many wires it's going to be, but the way things happen are a little different, right? So let's say, for example, um, you semantically want a pair, and you know one bit, seven bits, sure, and you make a memory of all of these. We can imagine this, right? We 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 can see this right here we go so there's a mem notice how the mem 
actually turns into um, two uh, mems, right? There's the seven bit mem and the one bit mem. So by default, Friddle is going to give you a mem per thing inside of your uh, bundle, right? So if you think about, um, you know, in a lot of languages, conversation about, you know, array of structs or struct of arrays. Uh, even if you declare it like this, which would look like an array of struct scenario, right? You have the mem and here's the struct, the pair, the bundle inside. It's going to give you diverse. It's going to give you a struct of arrays, right? Now, perhaps you're wrapping a certain technology where you wish it wouldn't do this, right? You wish it would keep them together. One way to do that is this hack right here, which um, is going to uh, basically some type tricks, right? It's going to create a uint that's equal to the number of bits you want it to be. And then, um, uh, so now it's still going to be the same number of bits total, but we're going to get one mem rather than two, right? We're going to have, oops, I go down. I swear, sometimes it's so annoying. The right number of clicks. Let's zoom out. Okay, so if we zoom out, <laughs> we can see there's only one mem, right? So it has an 8-bit one. So yeah, so basically I created 8-bit uints, but, you know, type-wise, we wanted not that 8-bit uint, we wanted a pair. So now we can recast those same bits back to a pair. This is the optimization is manual. You shouldn't need to do this, but if you're really trying to optimize things, you might find sometimes you want to do this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It should be. At least for a bundle. Yes, yeah. So get with should sum up the internals. Now, the question you may be wondering is what happens if you have things that have undetermined widths. Uh, hopefully, they'll figure out the width along the way. If it can't solve that width problem, it's probably going to give you an error. But yeah, so this is a situation where, maybe not this mem example, but maybe some other situation where you kind of want to turn something into a lot of bits and then turn it on to a lot of bits. Um, this used to be a lot more common, and as she has gotten better and better, they've changed the language, so you have less and less need to do this. But you know, in earlier versions, you often would have like a bundle, you want to turn it to bits, and you turn it not into bits. Uh, this is the modern day equivalent of that. And fortunately, you do this rarely. But here's an example where you might want it. So if you want to have like a memory of a bundle and you want the memory elements kept together, you can do it this way. Cool. Um, that is the last of the tricks I have prepared. I will look up and figure out what's going on with the formal, uh, assume and insert, and what keywords are introduced, and how it knows which one to call. Uh, any other last questions? So I did want to uh, do a couple things for the future roadmap. Um, I'm almost done grading the uh, project checkpoints. Thank you all for submitting those on Monday. Um, hopefully we'll be done later today. Uh, for the code reviews from last week, uh, thank you everybody for set, saying those in. I've only been able to grade half of them because for the other half, the um, invitations expired. So that was an unforeseen challenge. Not your fault, that's my fault. So uh, I'm gonna ask some of you to perhaps, if you check your repo now and you see you have access to it, great. If you don't see my name there, please reinvite me or I might email you to ask to reinvite me. So that way I can see it uh, and do it. Yes. Oh, so for, oh, another point. Yes. So. Uh, uh, for the project, there was another username on there, and a lot of you dutifully added them to the project. Uh, that individual contacted me. They are last year's TA. So that's my fault for using a, a, a Canvas assignment. They are not on the staff for this quarter. I, I have revised the Canvas assignment to take your name off of there. So yeah, sorry for sending some spam. Don't worry. But for the, for the homework, uh, with the code review, yeah, that was an issue where some of the things expired and asked for new invites. Uh, I'm going to try and look for alternatives. I, People do really great code reviews using review features and chisel on GitHub, but it's still feeling like a really complicated process making like a blank repo to like do a code review. It seems like a really annoying system. And so I might see if we can do a better thing in time for um, the project code review. As a result, the project code review might be done, due Monday rather than Friday for that reason. Uh, although you should think about giving your other group time to do the review. So you should still think in your heads, you should have your code in a good enough state probably by Friday, so they have time to actually review it by Monday. Oh, well then we're doing it Monday. 
Great. <laughs> Good thing I said Monday. Um, what? No. Because I'm, I'm figuring out if I can try and do an alternative GitHub review. The other details I wanted to put out there, um, as always, every course here at Santa Cruz, we're now in set season, season right? It's the evals. We really appreciate the evals. Uh, you said, you can see this course changes every quarter, right? So I appreciate the candid feedback on the fly, but I also appreciate, you know, long-term feedback as well as having it on record for the campus. So we can keep operating this course every year. So please, please, please do the sets. I do read them. I do change the course for the extra credit for this quarter. Like prior course, I can't give it per person anymore, but if you reach certain thresholds of course, I can get extra credit. So if you get 50% of the course and you give 2% for homework, if you get 100% of the course and you give 5% of the homework bonus, now 100% for the homework, uh, it's 100% return rate. I noticed one individual is still on the roster. It's not turning in the assignment, so I'm not going to count that person. So if we get 18 and 19, I'll be satisfied. But uh, everyone else is turning in the assignment. So if everyone else does it, you guys can get some mad points. Um, so talk to your classmates about sets. Uh, 